Book three, chapter one of The Mask by Florence Irwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book three, Haven. One morning in early May, Alison Howland said to her husband, Phil, I want to go away to spend the day, and I want to go alone. Very well, he replied. Far be it from me to interfere with your plans. He was a little piqued till he noticed a smile in her eyes. I have arranged your day for you. Lena will give you luncheon, and I'm going to leave you some work that will keep you busy. She ran out of the room and returned with a big paper parcel. It's something I've been doing all winter, she said rather breathlessly. I don't want you to look at it until I'm gone. I don't want to be here while you are reading it, nor to see you, nor to speak to you till you've finished it and tonight I want you to give me your honest opinion about it. He looked at her curiously. She was evidently laboring under some unusual excitement, though she strove to hold it in check. You've written all this? he asked. What is it? It's a story, a novel. Don't even take the wrapper off till I'm gone. I haven't the slightest idea whether the thing is any good or not. I want an outside opinion. When did you ever get the time to do it? She looked at him and laughed mischievously. When you were spending the winter with Mrs. Deverall, she replied. Oh, bosh! Well, Al, I shall be delighted to read it, of course. You've got a darned good mind for a woman. But you lack experience, you know, and you won't be hurt if I criticize it pretty bluntly. Certainly not. I want nothing so much as a candid opinion. I have no technical knowledge, naturally, except what I have learned from my course at Columbia. In that, you'll probably have to slash me all to pieces. I realize that my lack of experience is a terrible drawback, and yet, do you know, in some ways I don't regret it. You don't? No, because it so sharpens impressions. Things that seem tremendous to me are simply commonplaces to more sated and seasoned observers. I believe that's the hardest thing about it. When you're fresh to impression, you're too inexperienced to record it with any degree of art. And after you've acquired your art, the edge has gone from your perception. You are less impressionable. It's another form of that wonderful French proverb, Si la jeunesse savait, si la viesse pouvait. I think that is the saddest wisdom I ever heard. He threw her a quick look. She had said a number of curiously striking things lately. Where are you going? he asked. Oh, I don't know. Out into the country somewhere. I have the wanderlust. I shall take my luncheon with me and just spend the day roaming. I'll sit in the hedgerows and under the trees and use my time wondering what you are thinking of my story. I'll wander and wonder, and I'll be back by dusk. You shouldn't be walking around alone in that way. Nonsense, she said quickly, but she looked pleased. I won't get out of sight of the houses. I shall be as safe as the Bank of England. All her arrangements having been made in advance, it did not take her long to get ready. When she returned, hatted and coated, her husband was sitting with his back to her. Bending, she dropped a light kiss on the crown of his head. If that stuff of mine is any good, she said, I shall expect you hereafter to treat me with proper respect. Don't I treat you with proper respect now? She shook her head. He couldn't tell how fast her heart was beating how carefully she had rehearsed every move in this game that she had planned, how wildly she was hoping that not a single one might miscarry, how hard she was trying to avoid wounding his self-respect, even while she dropped the necessary hints. No, she said, when I come to be a really important person, I shall expect you to rise whenever I enter the room. Goodbye, dear and blowing him a kiss she hurried out. She was so excited that she forgot all about taking a car. She walked rapidly, her head held high, her breath coming quickly, her eyes big and eager, and a rather wistful smile on her lips. 
along the street bunches of daffodils and violets and arbutus were being offered for sale their perfumed breath mingled with her fancies and gave her the feeling of being a girl again back in coningsboro responding with every fibre of her being to the call of the spring and yet totally ignorant of what that call meant or of what life held in store how seriously she used to take all those problems which seemed so important how she used to worry over poor little rat-faced joey mengle and his home training well after all why not perhaps her sense of real values had been keener then than now perhaps she had let it get blunted before she realized it she found herself at forty-second street she was a vagabond for the day nothing called her she could go where she pleased she had started out with a dim idea of directing her steps towards one of the ferries but since she was here it made no difference the grand central station would do just as well inquiry elicited the information that she had just time to catch a train up the hudson which was leaving in ten minutes she bought a return ticket to a point some twenty miles out and entering the car chose a seat on the riverside and immediately fell into a brown study it is safe to say that of all the passengers in that car not one was thinking and planning farther ahead than was this tall slender girl in black with the knot of violets at her breast the present had fallen entirely away from her no thoughts of meals nor of clothes nor of parties nor of servants distracted her nine out of every ten of the women around her were palpitating over one or another of these subjects while their husbands in town were wrestling with business or bonds or employees or employers none of these things disturbed alison howland every particle of her mind every ounce of her force every one of her hopes and fears were centered around her great scheme she was about to play a long game for a big stake if she lost she would lose heavily she couldn't quite visualize her future under those conditions but if she won she would win everything that she wanted in the world alighting at her station she wandered simply wandered until she was tired and hungry glancing at her watch she found that it was half-past two and she sat down to eat her luncheon under a tree half-past two where would phil be by this time in her manuscript he read rapidly she hoped that he wouldn't read too rapidly there were certain bits that she didn't want him to miss one by one she ran them over in her own mind she knew them all by heart would he like such and such a one would he disapprove of such another suddenly with one of those quick mental revulsions which come to every creator she felt that her whole story was worthless it was just ordinary trash it had no particular merit how could she ever have supposed that it had and with this thought came the feeling that the bottom had dropped out of everything if she couldn't write if her story was no good her scheme couldn't possibly succeed oh she couldn't bear that succeed she must she had worked so hard she had tried so hard she had prayed so hard she had hoped so hard that she simply could not stand failure and it wasn't as if her plan was selfish if she were putting all this effort into something from which she alone would benefit it would be different but she wasn't she wasn't and so in alternating fits of elation and depression she spent her day till the lengthening shadows and the sunset glow warned her that she must return and end her suspense she craved and yet dreaded the verdict that awaited her at home phil's day had been scarcely less harrowing no less indeed except for the fact that his mind was necessarily occupied while his wife's was free as soon as alison had gone he had betaken himself to his study when lena had tapped to announce luncheon he replied that he was too busy to come out she might bring him a bite of food and a cup of tea 
and just as dusk fell he finished his task and sat staring into space the manuscript in his hands was called the mask and there was no question as to its merit phillips howland would have given years of his life to have been its author with varying emotions he had read it he had opened it with an interested tolerance expecting to find about the sort of thing that one would ordinarily find under like conditions the first work of a writer who has lived in the world just twenty-five years and who has known life itself but three of those twenty-five is not apt to be wonderful a prodigy writes earlier a normal writer does his best work after longer experience not necessarily writing experience just experience for instance as far as phil howland knew his wife had never had a sentimental tete-a-tete -tete with any man but him except that one short experience with ferris and but for the one with keppner he was right what he failed to understand was that to a woman of alison's type self-communion was the one great necessity she could watch the enthralling drama of life and then thresh it all out with herself well anyhow be the process what it might this story of hers was remarkable not perfect naturally but distinctly striking there was a breadth to it a perception that fairly astounded the man who read it so it appeared innocence and decency weren't necessarily limitations after all they might even tend to clarify vision there was a spotlight brilliancy about some of alison's flashes that was dazzling she had succeeded in catching that first quick feeling that had been her own response to new experiences and in recording it the lack of grandiose qualities in her nature was reflected in a corresponding simplicity and directness of style she had thought of herself not at all of her audience not at all of her subject exclusively and vitally her viewpoint was placed at a refreshingly original angle phil himself would have given much to possess such an outlook despite his beautiful style his everlasting barrier had been lack of original ideas he had manner but he lacked matter and that was his trouble he felt very bitter over it it wasn't his fault that inspiration wouldn't come hour after hour had he chased it it was like the old recipe for hair pie first catch your hair that unfortunately was the one thing he couldn't do well would he have known how to dress it after he caught it the trouble was to get it hang it all anyhow why should al have all this luck if he were any judge of things there would be no trouble whatever in finding a publisher for her story and it would make a hit and he would then be forced to appear as the husband of the successful writer he phillips howland author of the inca and of mountebanks but here he squirmed a little where under heaven had al learned her style and where did she get all that clean breezy clearness of perception all that force and originality as a matter of fact this need not have surprised him so greatly alison howland was the exact woman to have done what she had done she had a natural endowment of mentality and sensibility that was far above the average the clean habit of her training had made for vigor her beloved occupation of just feeling things had served to sensitize her mind to receive and fix impressions her sudden accumulation of knowledge and experience had given her a longing to express herself and to make some record of the things that so struck her lack of human companionship had driven her to writing and by her conscientious study of the beautiful style which was her husband's birthright she had formed her own manner why should she not be able to write a book several times that day as phil howland sat reading his wife's manuscript he was assailed with a jealousy of which he was instantly ashamed each time he put it quickly away from him he wouldn't be small he wouldn't be mean not to al he couldn't go back on her after the way she'd seen him through 
he'd play fair if he died for it. The spring twilight had darkened almost to gloom when he heard the click of the front door and the sound of his wife's light step. Phil, she called, where are you? Here, he answered. She came and stood framed in the doorway, one hand pressed to her breast as she tried to see his face. Well? she asked. Better than well, he responded, rising and going to her. Al, you've done the trick. It's fine. Do you mean it? she cried, and her voice was almost sharp in its eagerness. Is it really good? Generosity of praise was not of Phil's nature, even normally, and the bitter recognition of his own deficiencies, revealed by this day's work, did not make it easier for him to give the tribute that was due. But he stuck loyally to his finer instincts. It certainly is good, he replied. His self-respect rose with every word that he uttered, and each compliment came more easily than the last. That story of yours ought to make a ten-strike, he added. Oh, Phil! Her voice sounded as though she were about to cry. If it only would! You honestly think that you can find a publisher who will take it, and that it will be a success? I'm sure of it. There are a few crude places that I want to go over with you. Nothing to do with the theme itself, just matters of story construction. Oh, yes, yes, she cried. I want you to make all the corrections that you possibly can. Cut it and slash it as much as you please. There'll be mighty little of it to do, he told her. Astonishingly little, considering that it's a first book. They spent that evening going over the manuscript, and on the morrow Phil took it out to be typed. He was rather nervous and irritable during the next few days, but he never went back on his resolution to help his wife to success and to begrudge her nothing. Finally the typewritten copy came home and was re-read, and at last it became a question of a publisher. You'll take it for me? asked Allison. Certainly, if you want me to. And to your own publishers? I don't think you'd get any better ones. And, Phil, there's just one thing more, dear. I want it published anonymously. She could no more fail to see the look of relief that passed over his face than he could prevent its passing. Nevertheless, why do you do that, Al? he asked. I want to. You shouldn't. It isn't as if it were a story to be ashamed of. It's well done, and it's going to make a hit. Now, Phil, that story is mine, isn't it? And I have a right to do as I please. Very well. I insist that it shall be published anonymously, and that not even your publishers shall know anything about the author. I want you simply to leave it with them and say that there is just one stipulation. If they decide to publish it, they must do it anonymously. And unless you're willing to do that, I shall take it myself. Why, I'll do it, of course, if you want me to. But I can't see your point. However, Alison was so determined that there was no sense in further argument. At the end of a week, Phil had a note from his publishers. He returned from the interview very much excited. They wanted the book, and they liked the idea of anonymous publication. It was good advertising. Phil had demanded a generous sum in advance royalties, and was to receive it. By George, Al, you've hit it, he said. Of course, they were very careful not to be too enthusiastic. That's their business. But it was easy to see that they don't intend to let that manuscript get out of their office. When it came to a question of signing the contract, Alison insisted that her husband do it. She claimed very sensibly that if she appeared at all in the matter, the secret might leak out. Well, I can't for the life of me see why you should mind that, said Phil, looking at her in a puzzled way. I don't understand you at all. Anyone would think you'd be crazy to come out in the open instead of hiding behind me all the time. He was growing as interested over the success of the mask, as though he were indeed its author. Also, although he never actually formulated the idea, there was a feeling in the back of his brain 
that decency leaves a better aftertaste than meanness it is good to be able to pat yourself on the back proofreading would not begin for a month or so and summer was upon them they were feeling particularly affluent phil's five thousand from mrs deverall and the advance royalties on the mask made a generous addition to their income they decided not to spend the summer in town nor yet in coningsboro and they certainly never wanted to go back to that horrible cheap suburban hotel where they had been two years ago let's go farther away than that said alison how about europe asked her husband for a moment she looked radiant at the idea but after a little consideration she shook her head no she said i think not yet we'll go there before long though but i'm not quite ready and i shouldn't want to be rushed on my first trip abroad i should want the pleasures of anticipation then there's the proof it would be sure to make delay if all those batches of proof had to cross and recross the ocean and i have set my heart on seeing that book come out in october they had all the delight of looking over tourist books and discussing plans and their final decision was reached after a talk with one of phil's actor friends he assured them that there was only one summer resort in the world and that was sconset on the island of nantucket his tales of its quaintness and its many attractions appealed to both of his hearers alison was fascinated with the idea of an island and lighthouses and quaint streets with town pumps it all sounded so picturesque and different from anything that she had ever seen that her vote was immediately cast in favor of sconset and phil agreeing sconset it was for them that summer End of book three chapter one Book Three, Chapter Two of The Mask by Florence Irwin. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Fallon, Phil's actor friend, may have been guilty of some exaggeration in calling Sconset the only summer resort in the world. For that, however, we shall have to pardon him on the score of precedent. There are so many only places, only girls, only books, and only what not that the expression has come to be an accepted hyperbole and in the case of the howlands mr fallon's assurance was entirely justified for that particular summer no place could possibly have suited them better fallon was a star of some renown who had been engaged by mrs deverall to play the part of the lover in phil's inca a strong mutual admiration had sprung up between author and actor and at Sconset, Fallon was one of the most popular members of a colony of artists, all eager to welcome the gifted Mr. Howland to their midst. Phil was in his element, and he found the summer not only enjoyable but instructive. He picked up many a useful bit of knowledge about the technique of playwriting, in which he had always been keenly interested. Alison, for her part, was enthralled it was a new life she couldn't recognize herself and she was so seething with fresh impressions that she felt as though she would burst in trying to contain them she wandered around excited restless stimulated the surf the downs the dunes the harbor the town the lighthouse all opened new brain worlds to her she used to get phil out on the beach and make him discuss with her the various personalities in their present circle at first this did not interest him particularly he always said that he took people as he found them some he liked others he didn't more often than not his feelings were influenced by their attitude towards him but left to himself he would never sit down deliberately to analyze characters he would never imagine hypothetical situations and the way that they would affect different persons in a word he had never been as much interested in thoughts as in the manner of their expression hang it all al he said one afternoon as they lay stretched on the sand watching the tumultuous surf 
you might just as well ask me how i think fallon would look with his wife's hat on his head well how do you think he would she retorted instantly by every means she was trying to stimulate his imagination you don't mean to say that that really interests you no i don't that was your suggestion not mine but even so it is rather amusing however it is mental traits not physical ones that are interesting think of those convicts on blackwell's island that we saw from the boat the day we came up here don't just say prisoners poor devils and let it go at that think of them as men penned up there without space for moral breathing imagine them looking out on the limitless star-studded sky and on the free wide water with its passing craft strains of music from the boats would be carried to their ears the lights would float across space to their weary eyes and then would come their inevitable nightly return to the tiny pens to which they are doomed try to fancy their feelings some bitter some hopeless all sad some eager to be free in order to get even with the world others longing for a chance to do better imagine the homes from which they came the links in the chain that binds them isn't that tragedy for you yes i suppose it is but it is so commonplace it is just the usual convict's life that my dear boy is just where you are wrong it is your vision of it that is usual and commonplace and limited the writer who can get to the intimate soul throb of one of those convicts is the one who can produce a masterpiece of illumination i suppose there are no new things in the world except mechanical inventions there certainly can be no new passions nor desires nor comedies nor tragedies they have all existed from time immemorial modified by circumstances only it is the point of observation the sympathy of perception and the force of imagination that enable one man to portray them better than his fellows the material is all there it needs but the moulding hand phil had pulled his hat brim far down over his eyes his hand was idly piling the sand into heaps for a moment he did not speak and then he said what else did you notice on that boat oh phil dear dozens of things i could talk a month and not be talked out about that one trip indeed yes tell me something else you noticed well that poor pretty blonde thing not more than nineteen or twenty and decked like the queen of sheba and the horrible fat man with her he must have been over fifty years old she called him uncle you remember and you laughed and said that you knew all about him and that he was no more her uncle than you were yourself and that he had dozens of such nieces you remember yes well what of them this instead of shrugging your shoulders at the usual game and calling the girl a young fool and the man an old one look at it as a life history and a tragedy imagine that man past his prime approaching old age picture to yourself what that age will be the satiety the weariness the burden of foul responsibility imagine the boyhood and youth that led to such a conception of life and then the poor pretty victim whether an eager one or an unwilling one still a victim as much a prisoner as any convict that lives shut in a horrible self-made cell whose walls are constantly contracting to crush her and from which it becomes more impossible to escape with each year of her life think of her hours of cold loneliness she has her gems and her clothes and her motors and she must love them amazingly to have paid for them so dearly but they cannot possibly fill her heart she knows that she possesses nothing else has no hope of possessing anything else don't you suppose that she suffers hours of gnawing weariness and longing what makes you think about all these things al think of them how could any one help it after once knowing that they exist we have to think of course back in coningsboro i thought of life as far as i knew it 
and even then it seemed very wonderful to me but now when i see how wide the world is how various are the souls it holds i feel as if i could never get to the end of it all and as if there wasn't a minute to waste it seems to me that the great danger is the tendency to come to look upon important things as ordinary and commonplace that is the effect of reiteration take the most beautiful poem in the world for instance if there could be such a thing possible the first time that you read it you will thrill in response to its every syllable but if you hear it repeated seventeen times a day you will presently come to listen to it without heeding its beauty i think it is like that with life the first great need is the power of perception and the next thing is to keep that keen first edge on your feeling to keep yourself fresh as you might say of course with me the very quietness of my training assured my freshness to impression there's more to it than that said the man you love to think but you want to do it on certain lines it is people that interest you the most wonderful piece of machinery in the world wouldn't excite you particularly of course not it isn't alive it can't feel i should try to be interested in it but that's the precise point you'd try but you would have to try and probably after all you wouldn't succeed especially well and you wouldn't understand it even if some great inventor should take the trouble to explain to you all its wonderful parts no i shouldn't i don't understand machinery at all it seems marvelous to me that there are minds that can study the moving wheels of a machine and then know how to insert an extra cog or screw that will make them work in exactly the opposite direction precisely and you are interested in those inventive minds but not in those wheels because they are not alive yet there are persons to whom machinery is just as fascinating and just as comprehensible as are human beings to you i suppose so but it seems odd not in the least it is because you have a distinct gift the odd part is that you seem to think it must be universal that every one can and should be as interested in human minds and human souls as you are yourself i see she said slowly you think it is a gift i know it is and the things that we can do easily always seem so simple that we think any one could do them if they would only try but you could do this too phil not as you can after you start a subject i enjoy threshing it out with you but as a subject it certainly would never even occur to me unless you formulated it that is merely initiative you need nothing but the first push and you enjoy this sort of talk much more than you used to yes i do it's great fun and your own gift is so wonderful my gift words you mean yes why that's nothing the words are simply there waiting to be used she clapped her hands there you are she cried belittling the thing that comes easily to you just as you say we all do so are ideas always there waiting to be picked up take that story of mine for instance with its central idea of the mask that was suggested by mr keppner keppner certainly that night when we went to chinatown you were there and heard everything he said you could have picked up the thought as easily as i if only it had interested you as much i didn't make it it was simply there but to you it seemed commonplace and trite while to me it was thrilling it haunted me so that i couldn't shake it off was there ever a writer in your family asked her husband curiously no none that i know of or a psychologist or a philanthropist oh yes most certainly my father's father was quite an eminent psychologist he was considered one of the keenest thinkers of his day and he was a philanthropist as well there it is then 
his cloak has fallen on your shoulders i wonder mused the girl my father has always insisted that i am like my grandfather you evidently are replied her husband and then they fell to talking of alison's book and of the author's proof that they were both reading every day at sundown they rose alison lingered on the wave-beaten strand hitherto shalt thou come but no further she quoted softly and here shall thy proud waves be stayed what's that asked her husband why phil it's scripture it is well do you know it's mighty interesting language notice the curious use of that word hitherto we use it in relation to time your text applies it to space and that is evidently correct we say hither and thither that means here and there you see so hither must mean here hitherto to here to here shalt thou come but no further do you know that's great have you a bible al phil what a question of course i have well i'm going to read it she threw back her head and laughed she couldn't help it then but phil she said isn't it a wonderful thought to see all those waves rushing in you'd think nothing could stop them it seems as if they must soon inundate the entire land and then in obedience to their law and with no other barrier than a strip of sand they begin to recede it reminds me of a nation or an individual drunk with success no barrier seems possible no obstacle adequate and then suddenly the limit is reached hitherto shalt thou come but no further in silence they turned homeward their eyes filled with the evening beauty their ears hearkening to the thunder of the surf their hearts responsive to the great mystery alison's fingers sought and found the hand that was hanging by her husband's side and thus hand in hand like two happy children they walked home together in the middle of july alison had a letter from coningsboro that made her very happy elsa had a little daughter and every one was rejoiced i wish you could see roscoe wrote mrs terry he is perfectly crazy over the baby he says that if he sits in his office and thinks of that might his heart begins to beat faster and when he is at home he can hardly bear to have the child out of his sight she is the prettiest little baby that i have ever seen and she is named for her mother and for me elsa wants you to be her godmother even if it must be done by proxy in spite of her great happiness for elsa alison's heart was lonely and sad and her arms ached with emptiness she wandered alone a great deal for the next few days and couldn't settle down to work and yet there was no doubt that her own baby's death had been her husband's turning point never had there been such a bond between him and his wife never had he considered her so much and himself so little as since their tragedy how thankful she was that she had been given the wisdom to conceal phil's involuntary agency in that tragedy and that circumstances had made concealment possible public knowledge would have put phil in a horrible position all his life he would have been hounded by the fear that the thing was not forgotten he would never have gone back to coningsboro he would never have looked his father in the face his self-respect so necessary to his success would have received its death blow end of book three chapter two Book Three, Chapter Three of *The Mask* by Florence Irwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Early October saw the Howlands at home again in their apartment, and some ten days later came the appearance of Alison's book. Fame is an incomprehensible thing; 
it would be a brave man who would attempt to analyze it or to give an infallible formula for its capture only one thing about it is sure when it comes it comes like a thunderbolt a man may strive for years to overtake fame and strive in vain he may never succeed or he may succeed overnight he may waken some fine morning to find that he has captured it and from that day forth nothing that he does can fail and the next man may shoot his first arrow and bring down the prize with scarcely an effort while alison howland hoped for success for her first book she was not at all prepared for what actually happened by the time she had been back in new york two months she was almost gasping at what had come to pass the mask took like wildfire everyone read it everyone recommended it to everyone else everyone praised it the first edition sold so quickly that the second had to be rushed out and that in turn was exhausted almost overnight a few days after its issue not a copy could be raked up in the city of new york with a fine-toothed comb presses were kept hot the book headed the list of best sellers clergymen preached about it the publishers were besieged with inquiries as to its authorship alison used to sit in dazed wonder and marvel how such things could happen every day her husband would say to her you can't keep this thing up al you will simply have to claim the authorship it's bound to come out and she would answer it shall never come out how can it unless i permit it and that i shall not do but why not because i don't want to i can't understand you at all don't you care for the glory not the least particle and in that she spoke truly if the years in their passage had taught alison howland anything it was that her grandfather's creed was true the plaudits of the crowd are valueless every man's salvation or damnation lies in himself alone she looked back on those coningsboro days when she had floated in the still waters of undisturbed ideals and she thanked heaven for the perpetual anchorage they would always afford her she remembered the maelstrom of her first married years her first vision of life as it really was disillusioned tossed about frightened and embittered she believed that happiness was eternally lost to her but in the end she had found her haven and there she would rest forever in the shelter of that philosophy which had brought her peace she knew that neither her heights nor her depths lay in any soul save her own though she could not always control events she could certainly always control their effect upon herself she knew that ignorance was not bliss or that it was a very false and short bliss at the best and she knew that innocence and ignorance were no more synonymous than were sin and knowledge the whole world lay before her throbbing with life and pulsing with possibilities she might choose her path but she could tread it but once no step could ever be retraced it behooved her therefore to keep her feet from straying at the end of her path lay eternity and that too depended on her choice of direction fame a breath of air loneliness and heartache but for them she would never have achieved her end phil's future more momentous than fame a thousand times over love yes that indeed was good it was for her to give for her to win for her to keep success had brought the fruition of her great plan step by step she retraced it in memory she had realized first of all that before she could help phil he must be made to believe in her if others applauded her he would naturally come to realize that her opinions and ideas were valuable added to this was her anxiety to relieve judge howland of the incubus of their annual allowance if she could make money enough to offset it she could surely persuade phil to forego it that was now possible 
but the unexpected furore created by her book plunged her into an even greater dilemma. It came about in this wise. In writing The Mask, she had consciously molded her style upon her husband's. This resemblance was now coming to be recognized by literary specialists, and the claim was being made, with constantly increasing vigor and insistence, that Phillips Howland was the author of The Mask. The publishers, also believing the claim, began to urge that the psychic moment for disclosure had arrived. They grew apprehensive lest it be not seized. It was too provoking. It spoiled everything. Phil couldn't accept the plaudits without loss of all that new virility that was growing within him, and Alison had no desire to accept them. If she claimed all this sudden glory for herself, she would eclipse and irritate her husband. He would then slink in her shadow, his head would go down instead of up, and there would grow an ever-widening breach between them. She didn't want to be the successful wife of an unsuccessful husband, for that, of course, is what it means to be a woman. Of that sort of tissue are woven woman's love and woman's pride. The thing she hoped for, the thing she prayed for, was that Phil might have an inspiration and make a new success. On this foundation had her whole scheme been based. She would foster his self-respect. She would relieve him of money pressure. She would convince him that her own powers were not despicable, that her opinion counted. She would make him think. She would coax him to write and then she would efface herself till he had caught up with her in the race to the goal. Hand in hand with him would she go, or she would follow him. But positively and unwaveringly did she refuse to precede him. That was her plan. It was a pretty plan, and a subtle one. And now the busybodies were about to ruin it all. Alison grew fairly feverish over it. Her husband insisted that she must positively disclose her secret. She vowed with vehemence that it was the one thing which she would never do. He studied her curiously. Although it seemed to him that she must certainly be crazy on this one subject, yet he could not but be impressed by the dignity of her indifference to plaudits. Here was no preening parrot, no flaunting peacock. It is odd that we should be so eager to convince by speech, and so forgetful of the influence of our action. Alison Howland might have talked ten years on the transiency and unimportance of public praise, and yet have failed to make the impression on her husband that she now made by her daily life, and that without taking any thought whatever. Phil Howland had never studied any living creature, as he presently came to study his wife. Al, he said, suddenly one day, someone ought to put you in a book. Put me in a book? Why, how ridiculous! There'd be nothing to tell about me except that I've written a successful story. And that's a secret. You'd be surprised if I should tell you something that I think. What? that your book is one of the least of your achievements, and I'm not belittling it at that. It was strange how much pleasure this speech of his gave her, especially when she thought it over afterwards. At that time she merely smiled and said, If anyone ever put me in a book, I certainly shouldn't let him name me Al. Don't you like your name? I love my real name, but I hate that abbreviation of it. It is ugly, and it always reminds me of Mr. Kepner. You never liked him, did you? I admire his brain, but nothing else about him. It's odd how that crowd has dropped away from us. We scarcely see them any more, and as a matter of fact, we've picked up no one else to fill their places. That is because we are too busy. When we have time for them, we'll soon make a circle of friends. Al, excuse me, madam, Allison, I should say, 
this with a grin and a mock bow. I've wondered sometimes whether Kepner ever gave you any special reason for disliking him. She was silent. I suppose he did, the dirty beast, continued Phil. Yes, said Alison slowly, he did. I longed to tell you about it, but at that time I was absolutely sure that you would blame me. You didn't know me as well then, and as I was as innocent of responsibility as a newborn babe, I didn't care to be scolded for something I hadn't done. Her husband moved uneasily. Of course you didn't, he finally remarked. There never was a woman in the world who had less of that sort of thing about her than you. When was it? When Kepner made himself offensive, I mean. It was the very day that he asked us to accept a dinner invitation. In the afternoon I was alone, and he dropped in. He was horrible, and I ran and locked myself in my room and stayed there until you came home. You remember you remarked on my red eyes. I supposed that Mr. Kepner would not dare to re-enter the house for a long time, if he ever came at all, and that very evening he returned, and I left the room as soon as possible. When you came to me with that dinner invitation, I refused it, of course, and then you thought that I was influenced by race prejudice. Phil's eyes were lowered and his head was supported on his hand. An unusual color had crept into his face. When he spoke his voice was very low. And I was a dog, he said, and accused you of lying. And if there is one thing you are not, it is a liar. Alison, I was a beast. Can you forgive me? She bent over and kissed him, and then rushed from the room. She couldn't trust her voice, nor her eyes. Her slate was clean. She hadn't a secret in the world from him, as far as her own acts were concerned. And how wonderfully it had come about. Phil took her part. He was furious at Kepner, and three years ago it had been just the opposite. How he had changed. How everything had changed. How happy she was. All of this was very satisfactory, but the great problem still remained unsolved. What was to be done about the growing public certainty that Phillips Howland was the author of The Mask? Although Alison got no nearer to answering this riddle, a very welcome distraction from it presently arose. A certain dramatic star, a friend of Fallon's and an acquaintance of Phil's, wanted the book made into a play. Through the publishers the request was preferred, and by the same means of communication the answer was returned. The author of The Mask would be delighted to have the book dramatized, if satisfactory terms could be reached. There was but one stipulation. The work of dramatization was to be done by Mr. Phillips Howland. This naturally had been Alison's idea solely. Her husband had never even suggested it, but once broached by her, he had accepted it with delight. To both of them it was immediately apparent how harmoniously their respective talents might thus be brought into conjunction. The creative ability was Alison's, the finer craftsmanship, the dramatic sense, the linguistic gift all more mechanical than creative, were Phil's. The combination was exceptionally fortunate. And thus began the most exciting part of all. Phil worked early and late. He was in constant consultation with actors and stage managers. The piece was wanted for the late spring season, and no time must be lost. To Alison the work of dramatizing the book seemed stupendous. She honestly thought it was much more remarkable than writing it. In a book, as she pointed out to Phil, you could have an unlimited number of scenes and acts and settings. You could describe thought and thus prepare your sequence of events. You could explain and argue and convince. But in a play it was so different. 
all of the many book scenes must be compressed into three or four acts there could be no explanations and no theorizing thought must be translated into speech or depicted by facial expression and action it seemed little short of impossible phil on the other hand was in his element he was made for the task and his experience with the inca stood him in good stead his quick sense of values was unerring he knew the exact vocabulary that each character would naturally possess never once did the wrong word creep into his dialogue oh she'd never say that never in the world he would cry in response to some speech suggested by manager actor or producer don't you see that wouldn't fit her if she wanted to get around that she'd do it this way as quick as a flash he had the proper words ready then his aptness at visualizing and his gift of appreciating pictures made an invaluable asset joe won't that make a stunning scene he would say again and again he had never in his life had so congenial a task his writing was all done at home and he wanted alison always within call generally she sat in the study with him one day when the piece was well along he seemed unusually restless he kept glancing up at his wife's bent head she was sewing as she sat and fidgeting with his desk fittings suddenly he rose and began to pace the room hands rammed deep in pockets after a few hasty turns he stopped stock still in front of his wife and burst out al i want to tell you something i'll never rest till i get it out i suppose you'll think i'm a damned thief though i vow to you it didn't seem anything to me at the time you know my mountebanks she nodded raising to him clear eyes that were filled with gentleness he took a deep breath and hurried on well i got the whole idea of that thing from an old french book that i found on a bookstall on one of the paris quays you mean that it is nothing but a translation oh no the poem is mine everything is mine except the central thought and the name she breathed a deep sigh of relief he heard it and it made his confession easier it was an obscure piece of prose in old french with the long s's you know and it was called les saltimbanques which is an exact translation of mountebanks of course and the idea of it struck me tremendously i used to think it over as i tramped up and down the streets till at last the meter of the poem began to fit itself to my footsteps and the words began to come it was absolutely necessary for me to put them down on paper i couldn't rest till i did it she nodded i know all about that she said yes well when it was done i knew it was good i knew i'd never surpass it if i worked a lifetime the man who wrote it had been dead for years he'd put it in such poor form that no one had ever noticed it and his thought was lost and i needed money more than i'd ever needed it in my life honestly i hardly knew where my next meal was to come from so i sent the thing off to a publisher never dreaming that it would become famous i simply hoped that there'd be someone with enough poetry in his soul to know that it was good and to give me something for it and before i knew it everyone was talking about it and my reputation was made of course she said i understand what could i do i couldn't say i didn't write it if it comes to that i did write the part that they were all raving about on your honor al do you think what i did was so very bad she considered a moment she could hardly guess with what anxiety he awaited her verdict no she finally replied i really don't dear but i am quite sure that you are going to be much more at ease if you make reparation how he demanded 
Why, I hardly know. Couldn't you prepare a note for future editions, stating the source of the material on which your poem was based? Then you would still have the credit for your fine poetical craftsmanship, which you deserve, and yet you would avoid false credit for the original conception. Yes, answered her husband. He spoke slowly and very soberly. Yes, I'll do that, Al. It's an excellent idea. Suddenly she rose and held her face up to his. As their lips met and his arms encircled her, she felt very happy. There was a lump in her throat, and she wanted to cry, but her heart was singing. After some time she asked, What about the Inca, dear? That, I think, is really mine. I've always been fascinated with the picturesqueness of Peruvian history. You saw yourself in reading up for me what opportunities for poetic flights the mere recital offered. Naturally, I didn't create history, but I took that last Inca and imagined him as a live man from his youth up and gave him a real romance. Honestly, I didn't do any conscious borrowing there. And it is even finer than the other, she reminded him. Phil didn't write any more that day, but his failure to do so was immaterial, because he had already been working at such lightning speed that he could afford to idle a bit. His was a mercurial nature. He either did nothing at all, or he accomplished Herculean feats. There were no halfway measures for him. He took Alison out to dinner and to the theater. As they sat in the darkened house, more often than not their hands were clasped, and they felt as light-hearted as a pair of children on a holiday. The completed dramatization of the mask was such as to raise the highest hopes of success in the breasts of all those concerned. A very famous manager, Broadhead by name, undertook to put it on as soon as it could be rehearsed. An exceptionally fine cast was promised, and a backer was found in a Pittsburgh millionaire whose enthusiasm over the piece was boundless. He predicted a sensational success for it. To Alison's surprise, she was told that it mustn't open cold, which being translated meant that it mustn't be tried out in New York. Where will they do it? she asked in bewilderment. Stamford, I believe, replied Phil. Stamford? That little place? But why? That's the custom. It's a very dangerous experiment to open cold. They always take a piece to some smaller place within easy distance for the reporters and the theatrical men. Stamford, or Poughkeepsie, or New Haven. Atlantic City, sometimes. They've chosen Stamford for hours. And how long will it run there? Oh, only three performances. A matinee and two evenings. Then how long before they can bring it to New York? If it is the success that they hope, they'll have it here within ten days. They're planning to switch another piece and get a theater in that way. I'm going to run up with the boys to the Stamford production. But unless you are especially eager to go, I think you'd better wait for the New York first night. Oh, yes, I'd rather. But you'll wire me from Stamford? Well, I should rather think so. The moment I know how it is going, I'll send you word. The day of the Stamford tryout, they were so nervous they could settle to nothing. It was a mere toss which of them would say to the other, Oh, do you think it will go? Do you think they'll like it? But whichever said it, the other would invariably reply, Of course it will go. It can't fail. They liked the book, and they'll like the play. Between them now, there was no choice when it came to a question of self-reliance. Neither of them was the prop, neither the clinging vine. They hung together for better, for worse, alike in their hopes, alike in their fears, each seeking and receiving support and encouragement from the other. After Phil left the house, there was no task 
to which Alison could force herself. She couldn't read, she couldn't write, she couldn't eat, she couldn't sleep. She was afraid to go out because of the expected telegram. At last it came. Almost before the bell had ceased tinkling, she was at the door. With trembling fingers she tore open the yellow envelope and read the message. Top-notch success. Everyone crazy with delight. Home tomorrow. P. She leaned against the wall, and her breath came quick and fast. Then, with the tears raining down her cheeks, she sent up a prayer of thanks for the good fortune that had come to them. Phil's return confirmed every hope they had nursed. The peace would open in New York in ten days. That would be Monday night, April 28th, almost a year from the day when he had first read his wife's manuscript. Accordingly, many letters were written. The dear ones back home were all urged to come to New York for that marvelous first night. They were merely told that Phil had written a wonderful dramatization of the mask, and that a great success was prophesied for the piece. Even in quiet Coningsboro had the book made a furore. Mr. Terry had mentioned it in the pulpit, and had urged the congregation to read what he had called the strongest combination of philosophy, unquestioning faith, and orthodox belief that literature has offered in many a day. Judge Howland, who never read novels, had read this one, and rather to his disappointment had found no flaw to pick in it. It suited Coningsboro ideals even while it stabbed Coningsboro complacency and self-sufficiency. With bated breath and feverish interest had the villagers read it. Elsa and Roscoe were the only ones in the home circle who could not accept the invitation to New York. They were sorry, but not heartbroken. Their horizon was rather completely bounded at present by a young lady not quite ten months old. Mr. and Mrs. Terry, Judge Howland, and Gertrude and Kenneth Rawle all wrote that they would be delighted to come on. As the opening night would be Monday, and as the Terrys objected to Sunday travel, and had moreover to attend their Sunday services, the entire party was to leave Coningsboro early on Monday morning and reach New York about four in the afternoon. Allison and Phil would meet them and take them to their hotel, where Gertrude and her mother would then have a couple of hours for rest. Rawle wanted them all, including the Howlands, to be his guests at dinner preceding the play, but Allison and Phil begged off on the plea of excitement. They would meet the balance of the party at the theatre. End of Book 3 Chapter 3book 3 chapter 4 of the mask by florence irwin this librivox recording is in the public domain alison howland and her husband never forgot that april night they pretended to dine at home in the spring twilight but the amount of food they managed to swallow was not very great alison had a new frock for the affair phil had insisted on that and he surveyed her with intense pride after helping her into its intricacies. By Jove, Alison, he said, you're the best-looking woman I ever saw. You're so different-looking. She colored with pleasure at his words. You are not especially bad-looking yourself, she told him. In sooth, Phil Howland was a man transformed. His stooping slouch was gone, and he held himself erect, the hangdog look had given place to an air of confidence, and his hectic egotism and aggressiveness had melted into something that was nothing more than respectable self-reliance. His regular life had taken the edge off his nerves, and his whole manner bore the buoyant stamp of success. They drove up to the theatre in a hansom, that being Alison's favorite conveyance. As they approached the entrance, she saw the words, The Mask, 
thrown in huge letters of flame against the pale crepuscular april sky and she felt as though the beating of her own heart would suffocate her they were the first of their party to arrive but it wasn't many minutes before they were greeting the others all very happy and very complimentary about phil's importance i never sat in the box with a playwright before smiled gertrude don't you feel proud to belong to him ally darling it was a rather superfluous question alison's pride in her husband was written all over her the best seats were forced upon the three parents gertrude and kenneth took the next best with many protestations but alison insisted that nothing would induce her to sit anywhere but in the background and they all understood that phil would want to be moving around a bit by eight o'clock the house was crowded and the standing room only sign was displayed on the sidewalk inside the curtain rolled smoothly up and the performance began there was no question about its success from start to finish the applause was constant and thunderous even phil was satisfied alison heard him mutter under his breath thank god it's all right and then give a long tremendous sigh of relief her hand sought and met his and there with tightly interlocked fingers they sat and watched their mutual success there were curtain calls and responses from the star and bows of appreciation from the entire company but even that wasn't enough at the conclusion of the piece somewhere in the house the cry of author was started and in a moment every unit in that vast audience had caught it up author author they thundered till it was like bedlam itself presently came the manager seeking phil phil frowned and shook his head but there was no choice nothing less than the appearance of the author could possibly still that clamor alison turned to her husband to insist her eyes were wet with tears you must go phil you must nothing else will satisfy them he drew her out into the corridor with him and then he spoke not i he said you i you're crazy it is the play they are applauding not the book you wrote the play go on out dear and tell them so they'll never stop till you do mr broadhead was called and instructed presently he appeared on the stage and managed to get a hearing ladies and gentlemen he said neither i nor the publisher is in the least aware of the identity of the anonymous author of that successful novel the mask but the playwright mr phillips howland is here and will be very happy to respond to your call and to receive your congratulations on his successful work while he was speaking phil had been saying hurriedly to alison i want you to let me tell them there is no sense in further secrecy let us take our happiness together let me tell them may i oh i don't know she faltered i'm afraid of deciding too quickly i'm afraid of making a mistake i ask it as a favor he whispered as he hurried away i'll watch you for a sign don't fail me and he was gone at his appearance on the stage the house went mad again and then he raised his hand and the silence was immediate and intense dear people he said i cannot begin to thank you adequately there is no use in trying but if it is true that the way to be happy is to give happiness then every soul of you here tonight should be steeped in bliss it is kindness of this sort that makes work sweet it is appreciation of this sort that spurs a man to further effort if ever i write a better play than this it will be because there is no other way of expressing my gratitude to you for tonight's success there are two sides to success the side of the man who makes the effort and the side of those who appreciate it and put it on its feet neither side can go far without the other so you see i owe you quite as much tonight as you can possibly owe me with all my heart i thank you 
I thank the ladies and gentlemen who have ensured the success of the piece by their skilful portrayal of its various characters. I thank the manager who has been known to you too long and too well to necessitate compliments on my part. And to my thanks I add my grateful acceptance of that part of your appreciation to which I have a right, the part which applies to the work of dramatization. But, as I am sure you all know, the play is written around a novel of the same name which made such a hit this past winter that novel in spite of repeated reports to the contrary i did not write from the first however i have been in the confidence of its anonymous author but never until i sat watching this play with you tonight did i realize with what sweet lovable and wise motives had that anonymity been assumed while he had been speaking, Alison's eyes had never left his face. She sat as if spellbound, following his every word, unconscious of all else in the world. Just before he mentioned the secret authorship of the book, he threw her a quick glance. In answer, and almost like a person hypnotized, she responded with a nod. A smile lighted his face, and he continued, I am about to doff a mask of my own. The best way of proving my gratitude to you is to share with you my guilty secret. Also it is the surest means of convincing you that I am sincere in disclaiming credit for the book. Ladies and gentlemen, the author of The Mask is my wife. It will give her intense pleasure to help me receive your more than kind congratulations. He stepped quickly over to the rail of the box and held out his hand. Like a woman in a trance, Alison rose in response to his summons. She saw nothing else, realized nothing else, but just that Phil was waiting for her. The startled exclamations of the rest of the box party fell on deaf ears, their looks of incredulous happiness on blind eyes. By instinct she found her way to the front of the box. She reached out her hand and took Phil's, her eyes dewy, her lips parted, her breast rising and falling tumultuously. There they stood together while thunderous bursts of applause rolled up to them from that sea of clapping hands and human throats. Wave after wave collected, broke, and gave place to its successor. It seemed as if it would never end. At last it was over, and the satisfied audience began to disperse, and then came the more intimate congratulations. Mr. Terry was experiencing what was probably the proudest moment of his life. Mrs. Terry was crying openly. Gertrude and Ken were aquiver with happy felicitations and surprised questions and old Judge Howland kept swallowing something in his throat and repeating, My boy and my girl, my boy and my girl, in a voice that was suspiciously husky. They were getting into their wraps, Phil and Allison acting very much like a pair of sleepwalkers, seeking armholes, missing them, forgetting them, and then awaking anew to the necessity for finding them. When along came the manager with an invitation, the entire party must join him and the principals and the producer in a theater supper of jubilation. He interrupted his own invitation to add his especial laurels to Alison's rapidly accumulating heap, and then urged anew. Alison would honestly rather have gone home, but she saw that it would not only be ungracious, but that it would be a disappointment to the rest of her party, so she yielded at once. Mr. and Mrs. Terry, though anxious to go, were inwardly experiencing some little trepidation. The Rawls, Judge Howland, and Phil were frankly eager. Where are we going? asked Alison. To a Hungarian restaurant downtown, if you will. There'll be Italian cooking and delicious native wine and the most interesting crowd you'll find in New York. Carriages will be at the stage entrance in a few moments. 
the terrys and rawls were honored by being placed in the first carriage a little to the disappointment of the latter pair judge howland insisted on going with his girl so he and alison and mr westcott the producer got into the second carriage while phil together with broadhead and the two principals followed in the third the rest of the party paired off according to personal preference alison and her happy father-in-law sat side by side while the equally happy mr westcott faced them he fairly radiated delight and it was you who wrote that clever book mrs howland he asked how proud you must feel more thankful than proud she smiled wasn't it a frightfully difficult feat difficult oh no i think it would have been much harder not to write it than to write it after i once began to think about things at this judge howland gave a snort of pleasure the true fountain of inspiration laughed westcott impossible to damn alison tactfully turned the talk away from herself what a hit the play made she began her companion almost took the words out of her mouth by george didn't it though he cried wonderful simply wonderful where did you sit sir asked judge howland in a box oh no indeed broadhead and i were at the back and moved about constantly in order to take the pulse of the audience then we had men planted all over the house not to applaud said alison rather fearfully heavens no he laughed simply to watch the audience and to see whether the thing got over and there was no question about it it is the hit of the year you and your husband must give us many more such pieces mrs howland how happy you must be to be able to work hand in hand as it were arrived at the restaurant they entered a long room filled with tables around which parties were rapidly collecting on a raised platform at one end the orchestra was stationed at first the musicians followed their own program but as the evening progressed they repeatedly responded to calls from the audience giving any selection that was demanded in the center of each table was a cask with a spigot from this was drawn the sparkling pink hungarian wine broadhead's party attracted immediate attention the host and those of his guests who were professionals were already well known and the balance of the party looked sufficiently interesting to warrant frequent glances and inquiries nothing was formal intimates wandered from table to table everyone who approached broadhead's table either asked about the reception of the new piece or offered felicitations on the success they had already heard reported the newcomers were invariably presented to phil and alison and congratulations were incessant and cordial gertrude watching her sister began to realize that there might be something bigger in the world than perfect contentment alison had built she had achieved she had created that meant power and influence and perhaps even a name that would outlive her what opportunities were hers what vistas opened before her she had done something that had made the world take notice she had outstripped them all gertrude herself was the recipient of no small share of admiration her beauty and her charm assured her of that but the real glory of the evening belonged to those who had made its success mr and mrs terry having gone a little fearfully were distinctly surprised except that the conversation was more sparkling they might have been at a supper party of their own intimates nowhere in the room was there anything to wound their sensibilities although repeated attempts were made to lead the conversation into other channels it always came back to the mask small wonder either considering the reception the piece had had the most remarkable thing of all said broadhead was that the big punch came in that quiet second act we expected one of course in the third act and we got it 
but it was a regular triumph to get that second act across the way we did that was your favorite alison said phil nodding to his wife it was queried broadhead eagerly you picked that scene mrs howland why i thought it wonderful because of its very quiet and its restraint she replied the next scene was carried by action this by mere mental force its success tonight she added graciously was due of course to the acting of miss marden and mr sharrow and to mr howland's lines miss marden interposed quickly and so it went the graceful ball of compliment was caught by one of them only to be tossed by him to another but always the book and the play were the great themes of the conversation and always even among these professionals alison was singled out for admiration a woman who at one fell blow had set the world agog who had jumped into fame with scarcely an effort was not a woman to disregard as they talked a commotion in the front of the room caught their attention a famous italian tenor had just entered he was pointed out to mr broadhead's party just as he blew a kiss to miss marden later singers rose in their various places and sang delightfully some even walked on to the platform to oblige their listening audience there was applause and badinage and intimate dialogue the coningsboro guests scarcely knew themselves it was a different world from any that they had ever glimpsed even ken that incomparable worldling was fairly new to it it was late when they all separated after repeated good nights phil and alison got into a cab alone and drove homeward they talked but little as they sped through the lamplit night their hearts and brains were too full for talk they were glad to lean back in the semi-gloom and give themselves up to happy retrospect how wonderful it all was thought alison how marvellous even yet she could scarcely grasp it by far the greatest miracle of all from her point of view greater than fame greater than money was the present relationship between her and her husband how distant seemed now the unhappiness the disagreements the misunderstandings why only one short year ago she had been on the point of leaving him had indeed actually left him she shivered as she realized the abyss her feet had skirted but now that it was all over she realized fully that the things that had seemed so horrible at the time had actually been the leading strings of her happiness without loneliness she would never have turned to writing without suffering she could never have comprehended without their tragedy never would that first tender mutual bond have sprung up between her and phil and without her phil would never have succeeded in all humility and in all thankfulness she admitted it for she knew that it was true but for her phil would have taken a girl from the circle around him and have sunk constantly lower or he would have married some other delicately reared woman of alison's own class and the result would have been separation by exactly those inborn traits that differentiated her from other women had she been able to save him from himself and she thanked heaven for granting her the opportunity the ability and the wisdom how more than worthy he was of salvation there was sweetness in him there was responsiveness there was brilliancy it needed but the firm and patient hand of a good woman to keep him from the gutter then alison thought of phil's father she had been enabled to justify his affection she had given him a son of whom he might be proud for ever and to judge howland pride was the breath of life a certain intuition told alison that the old man's special happiness that night had been caused by his son's repudiation of that share of the praise which was not his right suddenly a flash of wonder assailed her judge howland had always been an inveterate bookworm 
had he by any chance long known of the secret source of phil's mountebanks well even if he had atonement had now been made his pride in his son was firmly established there came into the girl's mind an old couplet that her mother used to quote the clouds we most do dread are rich with blessing and will break in fullness on our head in fullness on her head had her own dread clouds indeed broken as she sat dreaming they found themselves at their own door once inside the apartment their tongues were loosed in spite of the lateness of the hour they sat down and began to plan for the happy future that lay before them they would work of course work together that was the foundation on which their entire edifice was to be built besides working they would travel together i'll show you europe promised phil and all the places i know and then we'll discover new ones together oh phil she cried it's come at last the thing i've longed for all my life it seems too good to be true everything seems a bit that way he laughed let's always keep this little flat for town use alison we'll need a foothold in town and merely for what we've been through here together i'd hate to give it up give it up she interrupted quickly of course we won't give it up why should we we won't as i'm telling you we'll keep it but not for a permanent home because you're going to have that real home that you've always longed for the sweetest little home in the country that you ever saw oh no phil you mustn't you'd hate it hate it i'd love it i can hardly wait to find it not really dear isn't it just to please me it's to please myself by pleasing you please god you are not going to have the sole option on unselfishness in this household in the years to come what about snowstorms i shall probably discover that they are as beautiful as mud beds what about furnaces if i can't make money enough to hire a furnace man i'll find my own proper level as a stoker he rose and going over to her dropped to his knees by her side and buried his head in her lap oh alison he said when i think what a trump you've been how you've stood by me and seen me through there aren't words to tell you how i feel about it you've made me that's what you've done made me body and soul no phil i've done nothing but tried to get you a fair chance that was all that you needed you never had it before well i've had it now and may i live to make good and the first thing i do with it is to see that you have a fair chance yourself as he talked his wife's busy mind flew off to plans for this happy future that he promised her she could see him in the new surroundings it was inevitable that his artistic nature should blossom more luxuriantly in a setting that was less bleak and bare with coming prosperity she could imagine him busy and interested cynicism socialism bohemianism all forgotten and outgrown he would be proud of his home proud of his wife proud of his do you hear what i am saying alison her husband's voice interrupted or are you dreaming i was dreaming i think what did you say dear i said that you must have something more worthy of your petting than i have been my dear if ever there was a woman born to be a magnificent mother of sons and of daughters that woman is you oh phil phil she cried and the tears were raining down her cheeks that is what i long for dear it is all that i lack no more lonely hours no more arms aching from emptiness but instead little feet to patter little bodies to care for little brains to train little lips to kiss as they sat there in blissful silence there suddenly rang in alison howland's brain words that she had not heard for years 
they were as distinct as though actually intoned by her father's tender voice a woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour is come but as soon as she is delivered of the child she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world in truth alison howland remembered no more her anguish for joy that a man was born into the world end of book three chapter four end of the mask by florence irwin